This idea of Ahad, one, there's one of the great writers on uh, Islamic theology in Pakistan, actually, uh, Rafi Uddin, Dr. Rafi Uddin, commenting on this surah, said something amazing. And I, I really appreciated it because I think for modern audiences, this kind of stuff needs to be said and heard. Allah created the human being with the knowledge of Himself. The human being knew already there is this highest ideal, Allah Azza wa Jal. And not just that there is a God and He created us and now we can do whatever we want. No, He's the Rabb, He's the Master. He's the, my goal in life is to do what He wants. This is my highest ideal. My greatest accomplishment ever can be that I become His slave. That would be the greatest honor I can have. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, His greatest honor, Subhanallahi Asrabi, Abdihi. He becomes Abd of Allah. The slave of Allah is a great honor. That's the goal in life. And Allah pre-programmed that goal inside every single human being. But if you lose sight of that goal, it is like this, you know, you have this uh, thirst, this hunger inside you to fulfill that goal. Allah created you with that. But when your appetite is not filled with healthy food, what do you fill it with? If you don't get the right meal, are you going to say, I'm not going to eat at all? No. When a person is starving and there's no food of their preference, or there's no healthy food, there's even filth, barks of trees, will the human being still start chewing on that when, he's, when it comes to that? They will. When you lose sight of Allah Azza wa Jal, and that no longer is your goal, then necessarily you will find a replacement. Necessarily. It is necessary to have something you aspire towards. That is the mission of your life. So the one who has found Allah, what, becomes, what happens to them? Inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. It's very simple for them. The one who has really found Allah, their salah is for Allah, their sacrifice is for Allah, their life and their death is now for Allah. The way they live, the way they eat, the way they sleep, what they want to do with their life, their long-term goals, their short-term goals, what are they going to do with their kids, why are they getting an education, where are they going to work, everything is now for Allah, that is their goal. But for the one who doesn't have that goal, they have to find another goal. And in old times there used to be idols, there used to be other religions, you find some other god. But in our times it's become far more pathetic. Far more pathetic. Now you have someone who's obsessed with their body and they're working out 18 hours a day. And their only goal in life, their only goal in life is to just keep getting buffer and buffer. It's the only goal. Take stir and look sharp, stay on top. Keep in shape. Or there's this goal they set with their trainer. I gotta do this many reps. Or I gotta do this many push-ups. Or I gotta get bench press this many pounds, etc. That's their goal. That has become their ilah. For a person that their life has become about money. They're, have you met people? They cannot talk about anything except their work. They can't. Yeah, I work at this company, I do this, 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 this. And the moment they lose their job, they become suicidal. Because that's all they ever thought about. That's all they ever did with their life. That's all they ever did. That becomes their goal. For some people, it's their children. They live for their children. They do everything for their children. Day and night, they think about their children. There is no other thought running in their mind. There is no other goal before them than their children. That is all they run after. When you don't find him, you will find something else. You will find something else, and you will run after it. And you will give your life to it. And this is, it. there is no exception among human beings. And today, it could be even a slacker. You could, and you could ask me, what about a slacker? You know those kids that play 20 hours of video games a day and don't get off the couch? Well, what is their goal? It is to entertain themselves. It is to fry their brain cells behind a screen. That is their ultimate goal. That is what they want to reach. And they're, they're working hard to attain it every day. Right? That's what it becomes. These are the psychological implications of understanding Tawheed. It is easy to say Allah is one. But is He one in my life? It is, is, he, is He the one for me? Or do I have some other one that I'm running after? Or some other thing that I've put before myself? Allah asked this question rhetorically. He says, مَا غَرَّكَ رَبِّكَ الْكَرِيمِ What deluded you from your gracious master? What was so important to you that you ran after? That you couldn't come after this? SubhanAllah. <laughs> SubhanAllah. So when he uses this word, هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ It's psychological implications. It's implications on our attitude towards Allah. And how we think about our life completely changes. Now there is nothing more important to me than making him happy. Nothing more important to me. 
than him being pleased with me. Nothing more important to me than he forgiving me. Nothing more important to me that he would talk to me on the day of judgment telling me that I'm successful. He will look towards me. I will not be from the ones he turns away from. وَلَا يُكَلِّمُهُمُ اللَّهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Allah will not talk to them on the Day of Judgment. May Allah not make us from those people. These are some of the psychological implications of just internalizing ahad. Ahad. Just that word. What Allah is saying, this is who Allah is. This is what He's supposed to do. And I want to conclude because it's time for salah with the following. This is the, I can't quote Iqbal because I'm terrible at Urdu, but I'll tell you the meaning of the, the verse. Okay? Though I like the verse myself. So it's poetry. But he says what used to be, he's talking about, it's a poem about Tawheed. It's a poem about Tawheed. And he says what used to be something that burned in the hearts of men, what burned in the hearts of men, is now a subject of abstract philosophical debate. That's what he says. Now what is Tawheed to us today? Debates. Discussions. Abstract discussions in, you know, uh, in theology that have no end to them. No end to them. But what it used to be was something that burned inside the hearts. Am I fulfilling the rights of Ahad yet? Am I doing justice to that Ahad yet? May Allah make us of the people of Tawheed. May Allah give us in our hearts what burnt, the likes of which burned in the heart of Ibrahim alayhi salam and the Messenger of Allah and the Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'een. We'll continue the dars on Surah Al-Islam. Here Abu Bakr al-Baqillani wrote in the 3rd century, he wrote a book called I'jaz al-Qur'an, The Miracle of the Qur'an. And it's, you know, when I read that book, I was really sad, the first page. The first page of that book is very, very sad. He talks about how the miracle of this book, the scholars have given up on it, the Muslims don't appreciate it, they don't value this book for what it is, and we have come to the end of times. He's talking like this in the 3rd century. <laughs> Wait till he sees 2010, huh? Subhanallah. <laughs> you know, and he's that depressed in the third century of Islam. But anyway, he talks about reviving the idea of what makes the Quran miraculous. He talks about its miraculous language. But one of the things he says, he argues one of his chapters, is part of the miracle of the Quran are the predictions of the Quran. The predictions of the Quran. The Quran made a call. The call was Rome will dominate within 10 years. Within 10 years, they're going to make a comeback. They were dominated now, within 10 years, they'll come back against the Persians. The Quraysh heard that and said, come on. There's no way. They were crushed and annihilated within 10 years. And this, did it come true? Absolutely. This was a prediction, rather a promise made in the Qur'an. Now, another promise made in the Qur'an, Abu Lahab will be destroyed. And if you didn't already realize, Abu Lahab is one of the sharpest tongues one of the cleverest enemies against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One of the easiest ways, easiest ways, the Qur'an made itself open to attack. Abu Lahab could turn around and say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If he just says that, even if he says it sarcastically, you know what he could do? He could say, look, your book says I'm being destroyed, I'm burning in hell, but here I am taking what? Shahada? The shahada is supposed to do what? Protect me from the hellfire. So I guess your book is wrong. He could do that. He has years to take this opportunity to attack the messenger in this way. But the Qur'an said about Fir'aun, وَصُدَّ عَنِ sabil. He was kept from the path. Fir'aun was kept from the path. And he landed himself in Tabab. And tabbat yada abi lahabin. And what did we do? Miraculously, what did we find in the Qur'an? He's making sarcastic commentary about his hands, saying, hey, my hands still are here. You know? May you be destroyed. I don't see anything that Muhammad talked about. That's what he would say publicly. He would make sarcastic commentary. Never once did he take the opportunity to do what? Take shahada. It was open to attack. He never did it. He never did it. And we learn from that, sabil was fulfilled on him too. He was kept from accepting the path. He was kept from it, fulfilling the promise of Allah Azza wa Fulfilling that promise. This is part of the miracle of Qur'an. When Allah makes a promise and it's guaranteed, it is bound to occur. إِنَّمَا تُوْعَدُونَ لَوَاقِرَ Whatever you have been promised is guaranteed to occur, no doubts about it. 
May Allah Azza wa Jal give us an appreciation of the remarkable beauty of the Qur'an. May Allah make us of those who recite it properly day and night and understand it. May Allah make us of those who fulfill this wonderful hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu He says, I'd like to conclude with it. Ya Ahlul Qur'an, people of Qur'an, la tatawassadu al-Qur'an, don't relax with the Qur'an. Don't be lackadaisical about the Qur'an. Tatawassadu actually literally means don't turn it into a pillow. Don't lean on it. وَتْلُوهُ حَقَّ تِلَاوَتِهِ مِنْ أَنَاءِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ Read it like it deserves to be read. Follow it like it deserves to be followed. In all hours of the night and day. وَفْشُوهُ And spread it. وَتَغَنَّوهُ And beautify it. وَتَدَبَّرُوا فِيهِ And reflect deeply in it. لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ So that all of you may succeed. اللَّهُمَ جَعَلَّا مِنَ الْمُفْلِحِينَ May Allah make us from those who succeed. بَارَكَ اللَّهُ لِي وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقُرْآنِ الْحَكِيمِ The final comment before I let you go for the Salah break, which is in a minute, inshallah, just to get the introductory comments out of the way, is that this, uh, this year, when the Makkah was conquered, which is what the majority of scholars say, the, the word Fath in this surah, victory, is referring to Fath Makkah, the conquest and the opening of Makkah. <coughs> when this is mentioned, this year is also called Am al Wufud. This is the year of ambassadors. These ambassadors, these representatives came from many, many, many different places, from Ta'if, from Yemen, from Halazin. They came in groups of 40 and 80 and 100 and 200. And they came and they spent a couple of days with the Messenger والسلام, They heard the message of Islam. The whole bunches of them would accept Islam, take it back to their tribes, and the entire tribe would, tribe would become Muslim. So in a very short amount of time, a lot of different ambassadors from all over the Arab world came to meet with the Messenger والسلام, in this particular year, and people started accepting the religion, multitude after multitude after multitude. Contrast this with the Messenger going to the people. A, a, de- a decade or two ago, a decade ago, the messenger is going around delivering the message and people are laughing at him. And now the messenger is sitting in Mecca and people are coming to him to learn about Islam. How Allah turns, turns the tides and how Allah Azza wa Jal gives aid to his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now just a small historical comment. When Mecca is conquered, first of all, it's the only magnificent conquest of its kind which does not lead to bloodshed and violence. Any, any people being overcome by another people leads to bloodshed and violence. But there is none. Handful of skirmishes here and there, but overall there's no bloodshed. Second of all, it is the only incident of its kind where the military doesn't take advantage of its victory. And goes and loots homes and executes and this, nothing. Actually the public address is لا تثريبا عليكم اليوم There's no harm that will fall upon you today. These are the words of Yusuf salam when he overpowered his brothers. And these were the words used by the Messenger There are no parades. There are no dancing in the streets and waving the flag or the tank rolling by. And, you know, there's no footage of that. There's nothing. The only celebration that's being made is the worship of Allah. That's the only celebration being made. Because you know, when, a, when any other army wins, they give credit to themselves and their nation. When the believers win, who do they give credit to? They give credit to Allah. This is not the time to celebrate, this is the time to thank Allah. Even the Messenger enters in a state of sajda. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the first thing they do is clean up Allah's house. Subhanallah. It's, an, it's a unique victory in the history of the world. It's a unique conquest. We haven't seen any conquest like this in the history of the world. Subhanallah. Now we come to the second ayah. وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا The first word in this ayah is رَأَيْتَ And you saw or you will see, depending on which opinion we take that was mentioned in the first part. You know, a couple of surahs ago, Allah said, Inna أَعْطَيْنَاكَ الْكَوْثَرِ We've guaranteed you the abundant good, the ultimate gift, the greatest good. Part of that good to the Messenger that I mentioned earlier on today, is that the Messenger is extremely concerned وسلم, that the people will not believe. So before his life is over, this, his worldly life is over, Allah gives him a gift. You will get to see people entering into the religion with your own eyes. وَرَأَيْتَ is for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. It's a continuation of the second person that's been going on in all of these surahs. In all of these surahs, one way or another, Allah is talking to His Messenger. So, the Messenger wasallam is so worried that people won't believe. They will not believe. فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعُ النَّفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ أَثَارِهِمْ it regards to specifically the Christians, but other places, even other people. Are you going to kill yourself in grief? 
because of the consequences of their, them not believing. Illam yu'minu. If they don't come to believe, and Allah gives him a gift, you will watch them believe with your own eyes. So what are nas? Now, the first message of the surah was the victory of Islam. The second message of the surah is tasbih and hamd and istighfar, specifically directed to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Let's look at these connections bit by bit. At tasbih wa tathir, tasbih is a means of purification. Tasbih is purification. Now that the house of Allah has been purified of idols, now it is the time to purify the hearts as well. This is the per- perfect time to purify the hearts as well. So one is the purification happening on the outside, the other is a call for purification of what is inside. The fa makes it very clear, the fa in the ayah, fa sabbih bihamdi, fa sababiya. In other words, because the things that have happened, the victories that have come, because of them you should make tasbih, so the two have been connected. Now, I was thinking when victory comes, the words I was expecting was fashkur, be grateful. You know, when something good happens, you thank Allah. But Allah said, make tasbih, declares hamd, and do istighfar. Three things. Then, you know, normally in any other scenario, I mentioned this in passing before, in any other scenario, victory is the time of great arrogance. Victory is the time to say, we did it. We did it. We accomplished it. Get time to give credit to yourself. People will come and congratulate you. In other words, victory is the time when egos are at their highest. And Allah is teaching us, just because you've destroyed idols on the outside, don't forget there's a worse idol inside your heart, and that is arrogance. And this is the time when that idol can be born. So kill that idol by declaring the perfection of Allah and asking istighfar of Him. If that thought even came in your head that we won, we got Him, we're on top, we're number one. If that attitude even came in your heart, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Because that, those idols you can see, this is a more dangerous idol, you can't even see it, but it's there, it's a form of shirk. It is a form of shirk. Arrogance is a huge thing. You know? So this is, this is the other shirk that's being destroyed. If the external means of shirk are being destroyed, make sure the internal means of shirk are also destroyed. SubhanAllah. He's been using the messenger as a teacher. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I, I, I promised you to share with you the parable. I found it very beautiful actually. Shaykh Muhammad Qasim Nanudhi uh, is uh, recorded by Shaykh uh, Shabir Ahmad Uthmani in Tafsir Uthmani, it's in Urdu. His commentary on Surah Al-Falaq, he comments the notes he took himself from the Shaykh. And he says, he gives a parable explaining Surah Al-Falaq and the different kinds of harms it protects us from. He says it's like, Allah wants us to think of ourselves like the plant that a gardener takes care of. A gardener is planting a plant in the ground and it has different problems that it has to protect itself from. Number one, there are animals like you know a goat or a lamb or something that wants to graze on that plant, it wants to chew on it. Now the, the goat or whatever animal it may be, or even a bug uh, or a bird, it does, it's not the enemy of the farmer. It's only doing that because that's in its nature. Allah created it and part of that creation is it's going to eat a plant or it's going to chew on it. This is part of the manifestation of bin sharri ma khalaq. There are things Allah created and they can cause you damage, not because they're evil, but because that's what they do. You know, a, a shark or a lion or whatever is going to do what it does. And it's not because it's evil, it's just it's acting out in accordance with its nature. So in the way Allah created things naturally, there's the potential for you receiving harm just in the natural order of things. And so you have to ask Allah for protection from them. But that's not the only kind of protection He seeks. So He fences the plant around so the, you know, the goat doesn't come by and chews it up. But the next thing is he has to plant the plant in a place where it gets plenty of sun, it gets plenty of water, it's in a good environment. And it's, there are no obstructions, there are no things that keep it, no blockades from keeping it from the things that it needs. We ask Allah, وَمِن شَرِّ غَاسِقٍ إِذَا وَقَبْ And this غَسَق and وَقَبْ The barrier of dark, keeping you from what you, will, what you would otherwise have access to in the light of day. is just like that farmer who wants that there are no blockades, there are no obstacles in his path. And the obstacle for the human being clearly becomes the dark of the night. Then he says the third element is that if, what if you have too much water or too much sun? You get overwhelmed. And the plant, he, he specifically gave the example of the plant getting buried under snow or getting flooded with water, being overwhelmed from an outside element. وَمِن شَرِّ النَّفَّاثَاتِ فِي الْعُقَدِ I mentioned to you before, when people, their sorcery is done on them, they feel like they're being you know, uh, uh, suffocated from within. They feel like they are being pressured, or there's this heavy burden inside of them. 
That's the feeling of someone who's been, who's, who magic has been done on. And finally, he protects his garden and his plant from an enemy who wants to harm him. It's not just the elements, it's not just he wants to make sure he gets enough sunlight or whatever, not just the animals, but there's an actual enemy that wants to make sure his plant is destroyed. How does the surah address this enemy? وَمِن شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ إِذَا حَسَدٍ So from every angle, just like that plant the gardener wants to protect, Allah Azza wa wants to protect ourselves. And he wants us to seek protection for ourselves. So this surah is about protecting yourself from physical kinds of harm that may afflict you. The next surah will be about spiritual harms that can afflict you. So there's the body being protected in Surah Al-Falaq, and the, the ruh and the nafs being protected in Surah Al-Nas from waswasa of shaitan and evil company and things like that. The final comment on this I want to share with you about the hasidun, the people who have hasid against us. Who is on our side? What do you have to worry about? People, Muslims, getting all power. Man, they have this many weapons, and they have these many agents, and they've got this, and they've got the other, and all this conspiracy theory. Who do you have on your side? قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقُ All the darkness on one side, and the one who tears through the darkness, and brings light to you on the other side. What do you have to worry about? We have to hold on to this book and seriously believe in it. When it gives us counsel, we have to take it as counsel for us. We can't just take it as empty, you know, just a dars and some, some interesting knowledge, but go back to our attitude. This is supposed to change our attitudes. It's supposed to change our attitudes. I pray that Allah Azza wa gives all of us the strength to change our attitudes. May Allah make us unified with the Quran. May Allah give us a, a, a comprehensive understanding of it. I just want to make two announcements. Before So jealousy is a really terrible thing except وَمِن ذَلِكَ مَا صَحَّ مِن قَوْلِهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وسلم, From the things that are acceptable as what is authentically narrated from the Prophet وسلم, لَا حَسَدَ إِلَّا فِتْنَتَيْنِ There is no room for jealousy at all except in two things. رَجُلٌ أَتَاهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى مَالًا وَسَلَّطَهُ عَلَى هَلَكَتِهِ فِي الْحَقِّ A man who Allah has given wealth and he is exhausting himself in destroying it Spending it for the truth. He just wants to get rid of it all. And the words are really interesting. Fi halakatihi To destroy that money. I just, I don't want to look at it. I want to give it all up. It's like he can't hold on to it. He wants to give it up for the sake of Allah. This attitude of giving. When somebody has that, you say, man, not just, I'm not just jealous of his wealth. You know what, I, what you're jealous of there? His attitude. How does he have, I'm, how do you get that? How do you want to give money up so, so easily? Like it's hard for him to hold on to it, it's easy for him to give. What's the case with most of us? It's hard for us to give it, it's very easy to hold on. You know, especially when it comes to fil haq, in the truth, spending in the path of the truth. It's very difficult. You know, uh, fundraising can be like pulling teeth. For you to like uh, uh, give a hundred dollars towards the building of a masjid or you know helping out the madrasa or whatever else, right? This da'wah program or this or that, it's very difficult. But when you go to Walmart, you don't think twice. Yeah, swipe the card, it doesn't hurt. You don't think, man, this money could have been better used for you know the, co the kid's college fund or this. No accounting comes to your head. But when it comes to spending in the path of Allah, all of a sudden all of you become CPAs. Man, this money could have been, I need it over there, and this bill, and that bill, and the whole financial balance just rolls before your eyes. It's like you've logged into your online account just sitting there in front of the masjid, while the funders is going on, right? And you think all of the reasons why you should not be giving. But this person, we should be jealous of, who when the opportunity comes to give, he just, just let me get rid of it. It's like it's on fire when it's with him, and he just wants to get rid of it. This is the first person we should be jealous of. Now, you know, some people don't understand this, and what do they do? Man, I wish I was wealthy like him. If I was, I would spend too. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> Just like the money part. You'd spend, but not like he spends. Right? So sometimes we have these, you know, I really want to be rich so I can spend in the path of Allah. Yeah. You really mean that? <laughs> you know? Or do you mean I really want to be rich, and yeah, I'll spend a little, I guess. Because I feel bad. I said that already. <laughs> right? Subhanallah, we can't play games with our intentions. And so this person, it's, it's someone to be jealous of, some, something to aspire. Then, وَرَجُلٌ أَتَاهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى الْحِكْمَةِ فَهُوَ يَقْضِي بِهَا That's the first. He says, a, a man who Allah has given wisdom, here we learn, just like mal comes from Allah, you don't earn mal, you also don't earn what? Wisdom, that also comes from Allah. And so what does he do with that wisdom? يَقْضِي بِهَا Number one, he judges by means of that wisdom. When he lives his life, 
He lives in according, accordance with that wisdom. So here we're learning the difference between knowledge and wisdom. You can have a no lot of knowledge, but you don't act on it, which means you're not very wise. When you have knowledge, and you judge by it, you act by it, you live by it, you benefit from it, then you're actually wise. Knowing a lot is not difficult. You can memorize the entire Quran, thousands of hadith, you can learn Arabic, you can learn fiqh, tafsir, aqidah, you can learn all the ulum you want. You can become a alim. That's easy. That's not the hard part. The hard part is hikmah. Hikmah, the ancient Arabic definition of hikmah was you learn something beneficial and you act on it. If you do those things, then you are hakim. For example, fire burns. Simple knowledge, fire burns. If you still touch it anyway, you're not very wise. Wisdom would be you have beneficial knowledge and that leads you to proper action, you stay away from fire. So, so number one, أَتَاهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى الْحِكْمَةِ فَهُوَ يَقْضِي بِهَا And then the second, then the second, وَيُعَلِّمُهَا النَّاسِ He teaches the people with it. Allah gave him wisdom, and he uses it to teach the people. Here it's something else. Allah didn't say uh, he teaches people knowledge. He says he teaches people what? Wisdom. He lives by it first, then he teaches people wisdom. This is a person to be jealous of. This is a person that not only lives by it, but instills in people the love of knowledge and the love of acting upon that knowledge. May Allah make us people of wisdom, and may Allah people, make us people who instill wisdom in others. What, who is the biggest victim of shaitan? In the Quran, you, a lot of bad people are mentioned. But after shaitan, who would you put at number two? Fir'aun. You would put Fir'aun at number two. And I want you to note something about Fir'aun. And actually, before you know something about Fir'aun, I want you to note something about this surah. I'll ask your, remind yourself once again, what three names of Allah did we find? Rabbin Nas, Malikin Nas, Ilahin Nas. I'll tell you three things Allah says about Fir'aun. One, فَقَالَ أَنَا رَبُّكُمُ الْأَعْلَى What did he say about himself? I am Rabb. The biggest waswasa of shaitan, what you're supposed to attribute to Allah, he attributed to himself, Rabb. Listen to another ayah from Fir'aun. أَلَيْسَ لِي مُلْكُ مِصْرَى Pertaining to Fir'aun rather. أَلَيْسَ لِي مُلْكُ مِصْرَى وَهَذِهِ الْأَنْهَارِ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِي Don't I own the kingdom of Misr? Don't these rivers flow beneath and only I am the king of Misr? What's he referring to himself as? Malik. That's what he's referring to himself. So he mentioned himself as Rabb, then he mentioned himself as Malik. What's left? Ilah. Let's see if he committed this crime too. He turns to his chiefs and he says, وَقَالَ فِرْعَوْنَ يَا أَيُّهَا الْمَلَأْ مَا عَلِمْتُ لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَاهٍ غَيْرِ My generals, listen up. I don't know of any other ilah for you other than myself. For Fir'aun, we find himself declaring three things for himself. Rububiya, mulk, and uluhiya. All three for himself. Rabb malik ilah. We find the, the, this sampling that Allah has given us in the Qur'an is very important. It shouldn't be overlooked. And it's not just to, for you and I to say, oh man, Fir'aun, la'anahullah, what a loser. But there's something here. That is what the waswasa of shaitan can lead to. What was the biggest problem of shaitan? Shaitan himself, what was his biggest problem? Arrogance. Arrogance. What is the biggest thing he could instill inside a human being? Arrogance. And what is the worst manifestation of arrogance? Fir'aun. But you don't have to reach Fir'aun to be worried that you're headed down the same road that leads to Fir'aun. Today we are not living in a time where people declare themselves gods over others. But we are living in times where people declare themselves gods over themselves. They declare themselves their own master. I am my own man. I am my own master. They declare themselves their own king. King of the house. King of my territory. King of my domain. They declare themselves the, their own ilah. Their own hawa, their own desires become their ilah. Ara'ayta man ittakhada ilahahu hawahu. Did you see the one who takes his desires and turns them into his ilah? Even. We're living in times where we can each turn into mini Fir'aun without even realizing it. We don't have to have large castles and fight with messengers and you know, be arrogant, outspoken against Allah Azza wa Jal. But that, that concept of ego that is crushed in the beginning of this surah by you openly saying, I need protection. I need Allah's protection. I'm coming into His obedience. There's a very powerful lesson in this. 
very, very powerful lesson. Iblis himself recognizes the lordship of Allah, but wants the human being to forget it. He himself said, you are the one who created khalaqtani. Even when he was disobeying Allah, he gave him credit. Khalaqtani min nar, you created me from fire. Even then he acknowledged Tawheed himself. Even he himself. But he wants the human being to forget that Tawheed. He wants the human being to become ungrateful. May Allah protect us from the waswasa of shaitan. Another of your listeners asked, how can I improve my character? Step one, do no harm. Stop doing bad things. Don't talk about adding good deeds until you get rid of bad deeds. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't talk about giving a patient medicine until you stop the bleeding first. It doesn't make any sense. You know, so you got to stop the entertainment addiction. You got to stop the, the, the watching the filth. You got to stop. You got to start lowering your eyes when you're walking down the street because you're becoming less of a human every time you stare at a woman and you stare at her like she's a piece of, a piece of meat, like she's an animal. That just means you've lost respect for a fellow human being. That's all, that's all that means. Mm -hmm. To you, that's nothing, nothing but you're looking at her like a, 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 an ape looks at like a female ape. You know, like a dog looks at a female dog. That's all you've turned into an animal. Regain your humanity first and then embellish, beautify your life with good deeds. Do simple, small things. Get perfect your prayer, memorize a few supplications, try to you know, uh, be honest in your workplace. Be kind to your mother. These are not complicated things. This is what the Creator wants from us. That's all but, He wants. But if someone says, why? Why does He want this from me? What, what is it? Is this benefiting Him? That's a great question. Um, everything Allah wants from us, his, his, one of His names is Al-Ghani. Ghani means someone who doesn't need anything. And He told us that in, in an ayah in which He basically told us to do certain things. And He says, فَهُوَ الْغَنِي And He's free of need. وَأَنْتُمُ الْفُقَرَاءِ You're the ones that are bankrupt. Now, in that ayah, he doesn't need anything and we need everything because we're bankrupt. And then he told us to do a few good deeds. And if you do a few good deeds, he will make you ghani. He'll make you free of need. He'll give you, shower you with blessings. Not only are good deeds beneficial to us because they in and of themselves are like medicine, but they bring with them bonuses in this world and the next world. You be kind to your mother and you never know. You've been looking for a job forever and you're also mean to your mom. You start being kind to your mother and mysteriously you get a call back. I want you to come in for an interview. The blessings of being kind to your mother. One good deed will open up other doors for you. This is what Allah does in this world. Whoever becomes conscious of Allah, يَجْعَلَّهُ مَخْرَجًا He starts making doors open for them, making a way out for them. وَيَرْزُقُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسَبِ He starts providing him from where he couldn't even imagine. All because this person became conscious of Allah. Right? That's all Allah is asking us of. And He's asking us for us to make our life better. Last comment, Allah says, you know, people say, what does God want? It's a really fundamental question. What does God want? There's, an, there's a few ayat that tell us the answer. One of them is, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُخَفِّفَ عَنْكُمْ وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِيفًا Allah wants to lighten your burden. And, the, man, and human, the human being was created weak. You think you're making your life easier by partying? You're making it harder. I want ease for you. I want to take the burden off of you. You just don't understand it. You're too weak. You know, subhanAllah. There's a powerful expression in the Quran. It's captured in two words. Those two words are qurrata a'yun, the coolness of the eyes. A simple translation will yield coolness of the eyes. And it's mentioned in a number of occasions, it's also found in a hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay. Before I tell you how it's used in sacred text, I want to tell you how the ancient Arabs used to use this figure of speech, this expression. It's really a figure of speech, so we can't really understand it literally, it means something more. In the Arab idiom, there were two expressions, without getting too technical with you guys, there's the eyes becoming cool and the eyes becoming warm. That's the first thing I'd like you to know. The Arabs had two figures of speech, the eyes becoming cool and the eyes becoming warm. When somebody is shedding tears of sorrow, they're suffering the worst kind of fate. They are in deep depression and sadness and calamity. Then when you would look at them, the Arab would say at least, his eyes have become warm. 
One of the worst curses you can curse upon someone in the Arabic language, in ancient Arabic, أَثْخَنَ اللَّهُ عَيْنَهُ May Allah make his eyes warm. Means may he suffer the worst kinds of sorrows in his life. The exact opposite is what? The eyes becoming cool. For your sorrows, for your sadness, for your pains to be removed completely, and for you to feel peace and tranquility and joy like nothing else. And I'll give you, I'll give you a simple example of coolness and warmth of the eyes before I continue. Imagine you're at the airport, right? And there are two pair, there's a pair of a mother and a son, and another mother and another son. But this mother is saying farewell to her son. He's flying off somewhere. And the other mother is greeting her son, who flew in from somewhere. And both of the mothers are crying. But one of them, their eyes is cool, and the others, the eyes are warm. One is shedding tears of joy. She sees her son after many years. She's crying too, but these are eyes becoming cool. The others letting go of her son, these are what? The eyes becoming warm. You understand the difference? Right? Now, another, you know, a few pieces of context before I go further. The poet in Arabia says, my, the, the eyes of my tribe will remain warm. And he's actually an assassin also. Yeah, poets are assassins. It's kind of an Arab thing, I guess. But, so he's waiting on a sand dune, waiting to kill the tribe leader that has offended his tribe. And he makes poetry in the meantime. I guess he's got a lot of time. So he says, the, 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 my tribe's eyes will remain warm until my dagger is warm, isn't warm with his blood. In other words, when I, when I kill this guy, then my, my tribe's eyes will become cool. The rage, the frustration, the humiliation they feel will only disappear upon this guy's death. That's what I'm here to do, to cool the eyes of my tribe. You understand? So it's a means of relieving frustration and anger and ill feelings. That's how the, in, in which context it's used. But then there's a final context that I want to share with you in Arabic literature, where this expression is found. It's very beautiful, actually. The Arab used to travel in the desert. And there's a sandstorm. And in a sandstorm, the Arab would, you know, wrap his face up, because obviously your face is being pounded with sand. Now the camel on which he's riding, Allah created the camel in a magnificent fashion, the eyelids of the camel actually trap sand and drop them. It doesn't even have to blink. It's got a screen in front of its eyes that captures sand and drops it. It's, we don't have that, you know, that screen system in our eyes, but the camel does. But now the rider, he can't afford to cover his eyes, can he? Because if he covers his eyes, what's the problem? He doesn't know where he's going. So he has to keep his eyes exposed. And so finally he finds a cave. He finds some refuge, and he says, interestingly, my eyes have finally become what? Cool. In other words, in literature, we find the precedent of the eyes becoming cool equated with finding refuge from a storm. Finding refuge from a storm. Now, I've set the stage for you for what this expression stands for, but I still haven't told you my favorite dua, though I recited it in the beginning. This is at the conclusion of the 25th surah of the Quran. Allah Azza wa Jal says, Rabbana, He tells us to say, وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ those who say, رَبَّنَا هَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنْ وَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا Our Master, our Lord, gift us, grant us. You know in Quran we find آتِنَا, give us. أَعْطِنَا, to give a grand gift. But hab, gift us, an unexpected gift, a beautiful gift. هَبْلَنَا, this is the gift you're asking Allah to give you. And lana is muqaddam, this, this prepositional phrase is brought earlier, especially for us. We're asking for a special favor to Allah. And what is this favor that we're asking Allah Azza wa Jal? Grant us from our spouses and not just our children, which is awla dhurriyatina. You know, wa future generations of us. In other words, you're not even asking for your immediate children, but your lineage from, you know, for generations to come. Grant us from all of them coolness of eyes. Make our eyes cool by means, of our, by means of our spouses and by means of our children. And I say this is a, my, my favorite dua for a reason. One, I'm married and I do have children and a spouse. But two, all of us, all of us, have to appreciate the power of this dua because of the crisis of the world today. The world's fundamental institution of family is under attack. Most of the people here, even Muslims, are not immune from this problem. In many of our homes, the storm that I said, when you find coolness of the eyes, you find refuge from the storm. The storm is not 
outside the house, the storm is inside the house. And you have to get away from home to get away from the yelling and the screaming and the name calling and the insults and the depression and the sadness and the friction between husband and wife and parent and children. Our homes are broken. Brother is not talking to brother. Parents are not talking to children. How many of all the shuyukh, I can bet you, I can, I can almost guarantee you, all of the speakers that have come to this conference, some mother, some father, some husband, some wife has come up to them and said, I've got this problem. I can't talk to my kid. He yells at me. We can't talk anymore. He's doing these things. I don't know how to stop him. My husband, my wife this, my husband this. Subhanallah. This is a crisis inside the home. And what better dua to ask? The, the exact opposite. You know, the, the family has become a place of sorrow, of depression, of sadness, of anger, of rage. People feel like they want to escape it. And here Allah tells us to ask so perfectly, so eloquently, that the home should become the place of refuge. It's like the outside world is a storm. And you suffer on the outside in your refuge, your safe haven is those doors in your home, is your spouse, is your children. When you see them, your worries disappear. first thing you got to do is you have to discipline your life people I have to do it you have to do it you know what it means to discipline your life go to sleep early pray Isha and go to sleep don't go to the hookah joint until 12 30 a.m. don't go see a movie don't go hang out with your friends. Don't watch Islamic lectures until 2 in the morning. Do not. It is not beneficial for you. Pray Isha and go to sleep and wake up early. Wake up before Fajr. Give yourself 30 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 I know it seems impossible. It's only impossible because of Netflix at night. Okay, that's the only reason it's impossible. Give the night life up. Let the night be for sleep. At least you're not accumulating sin every night. At least you're not burying your heart under more sin every night. At least you're sleeping. At least you're innocent for that much. At least that much. Then you wake up and you pray. At least start with the routine of praying Fajr on time. And the imagery that I want to share with you is one that will help you understand the larger concept of Sult al Asr. Imagine with me that you are drowning, that you're drowning, and you are unconscious. Two things you're drowning and you're unconscious. Do you have a lot of time? If you're drowning and you're unconscious, do you have a lot of time? No, you don't have a lot of time. Which means. There, your time is running out. And you know in Arabic, what word is used for when time is running out? The, time, the word for that is Al-Asr. Al-Asr literally means time that is running out. It's the last part of the day when the day is running out. It's time of Asr prayer. Okay? Asr literally comes from Asir, juice that is squeezed out. Time that's being squeezed out of your hands. You know, Asr al-Thawba even it's used. That you know, you take a, coal, a cloth that is drenched in water, and when you squish it like this, all the water comes out. Asala as a verb is used like that, right? To squeeze it out. So Allah talks about this time. Your time, you're drowning. You're you're unconscious. Your time's running out. What's the first thing you need to do to be able to survive if you're in that position? What if you hope to survive? What's the first thing you're going to need? What do you think? Wake up. That's the first thing you're going to need. If you keep, you're unconscious, then you're finished. The very first condition has to be you have to wake up. 
And even if you were in the most wonderful dream, and in your dream you were enjoying the greatest success, you're driving, you're driving a Ferrari down, you know, this, you know, they have these car commercials with the hills and the highways on the side, the water on the other side, right? You're in one of those cars, the top, top, drop is, the, the top's been dropped off, and you're just cruising along the highway, enjoying life. That's your dream. But when you wake up, what do you realize? You're drowning. You're underwater. That's the first condition. You have to wake up. Once you do wake up, you say, oh man, this is a nasty reality and I was enjoying such a good dream. I should go back to sleep. If you do that, what kind of person would you be? Insane. You'd be insane. Or someone at least who has no courage to accept reality. Because they found reality to be very difficult, they decided they're gonna put themselves back to sleep even though they woke up. Does this person, if he drowned, can he blame anybody else? The one who woke up and went back to sleep? You think? Someone who never woke up, maybe, right? But the one who woke up said, mm, this is not good. And they went back to sleep. They have no one to blame but who? Themselves. They have no one to blame but themselves. Now, let's imagine that they did wake up. What do you have to do next? Oh, it's pretty bad, I'm drowning. Even if you don't know how to swim, will you not use every muscle in your body to make certain kinds of motions to go towards the surface? Wouldn't you do that? And you will make certain kinds of motions that make you go further down, and certain kinds of motions that will make you go up. And once you discover which ones help you go up, you will only do those, right? You will do those. In other words, the first thing was you have to wake up, the second was you have to swim. You have to do something to try to get to the surface. When you got to the surface, you gasped for air, and you got pulled back down. You got pulled back down. And you know what you, who you got pulled back down? You won't believe this. There's a chain around your foot, and your relative, your cousin, is sleeping. And he dragged you down. And now you're drowning because of your sleeping cousin. What do you have to do now? You gotta wake him up. And you're not even waking him up because you wanna save him. Who are you waking him up for? You're, maybe you wanna save him, maybe. Maybe you don't even like your cousin, I don't know. <laughs> right? But what's the point? The point is, you're trying to wake him up because if you don't wake him up, who's also gonna drown? Yourself. So you wake him up, and he says, man, I was driving a Ferrari, you woke me up for no reason, I'm going back to sleep. Forget you. Can you just say, okay, well, I didn't like you anyway, suit yourself. Can't do that. If he goes to sleep again, what are you gonna do? No, man, wake up, let's go, let's go, we gotta, we gotta, you can't give up. You can't not accept reality. And you have to keep trying to wake him up until he finally says, okay, fine, what do we do? He says, let's, you say to him, let's swim together. Both of you come up together. The third time, you both get pulled down by your grandmother, by your aunt, by your neighbor, by your son, by your daughter. Does the process continue? The process continue? There's a four-part process to this people surviving. The first was they had to wake up themselves. Then they had to try to swim. Then they had to tell other people that they're tied to, this is the truth. Let's go. And even if they got tired, and some of them, one of them said, man, I can't do this anymore. We've been doing this now over and over again. I don't know if I can do it anymore. And the other one says, no. We are all gonna survive together. You have to do this. Come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. Keep going, keep going. You ever seen those kinds of movies where they're trying to escape from some army, and one of them gets tired and says, I can't run anymore. What do the others do? Come on, come on, let's go, let's go. We can do this, we can do it. And they, they get him to run anyway, even though he thinks he can't run anymore. They, 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 they work with each other because their, their survival depends on each other. They work together desperately. What does Allah say at the end of this surah? First He says, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِيهُ When Asr first of all, time's running out. Then He says, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِيهُ خُسْرَ I'll translate it, human beings are drowned in loss. You see the parallel? Human beings are drowned in loss. What's the exception? إِلَّا الَّذِينَ Those who believed. Believed what? Allah didn't say, آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُلِهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَالْقَدْرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ مِنَ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى وَالْبَعْثِ بَعْدَ Nothing. He didn't mention anything. Even though all of those things are included. According to the siyaq of the surah, the context of the surah, what is the first thing these people have to believe? That they're in loss. That they're drowning. And if they do come to believe that, and they correct their iman, What's necessarily going to happen? They're going to swim and move upwards. How does Allah describe this action? وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ They do good things. They do things that help reconcile the situation. By the way, salih is an adjective here. صَالِحَاتِ جَمَعُ مُؤَنَّثْ سَانِمْ Which is, literally means that which corrects something. Something was wrong and it corrects it. So they do actions that correct the situation. Literally like the guy trying to swim. 
But because they were tied to other people, what else did they have to do? What Allah saw? They had to tell the other the truth. And it's not even akhbaru anil, they told them about the truth. No, no, no. They had to wake him up and let's go, let's go, we have to go. No matter, and over and over again, Tawasi even has takrar in it. It has repetition in it. Over and over again they said, this is the truth, this is the truth, this is the truth. You know why? Because the people you're trying to save, even if you wake them up temporarily for 20 minutes, 30 minutes during a khutbah, guess what happens when the khutbah is done? They go back to sleep. They start drowning again. So what do you have to do? You have to go and wake them up again. Then they get sleepy again. Then you gotta wake them up again. This is tawasi bil haq. And you might get tired of doing it. You might become impatient. So Allah also adds, wa tawasaw bil sabr. You gotta keep doing it. Sabr means consistency, constancy, perseverance, patience. You gotta remain on point. You gotta keep doing this. Because your survival depends on it. In the end, if you do all of these things, but you have no patience, and you give up, you, will, you drown too. So even if you had iman, and you had good deeds, and you told people about the truth, but you didn't have sabr, you still drown. So how many conditions do you have to fulfill to survive? All four. All four conditions are required. They're, they're critical and they're necessary. Which is why there's a wa in between them. You see the logical progression from iman to amil salihat, to tawasul bil haq, to tawasul bil Beautifully articulated in this surah.